Greetings and welcome to this mini lecture on A Brief History of Comics Part 2. In this mini lecture we're going to take a look at the emergence of the physical comic book, the emergence of the superhero, and how the superhero ultimately leads to the rise of horror comics, and how horror comics ultimately lead to a significant redefining and censorship uh, campaign that is leveled at comics. So, if we're going to talk about comic books, the, we really do have to talk about Action Comics number one. It comes out in 1938. And while it's not the first comic book to come out, it is one of the most important. Because prior to this, there are comics that are coming out, but they, they sell, but they're not selling in any amazing numbers. There's enough to make money, but nothing to really make people think a lot about comics. And then Action Comics comes out. And we have Superman. And Superman is ultimately a game changer for comics. Uh, Superman is created by Joel Siegel in I'm sorry, by Jerry Siegel and Joel Schuster. And the two of them are teenagers at this point and ultimately create this is their third or this is their third third rendering of this character that they've been toying with for a few years. Uh, but a Action Comics is, in of itself, not a Superman entire title. It was a variety comic. It had several other types of comics within it. And so each story would run for, it could be 4 to 16 pages. Uh, Superman would have a story, and there would be a Western, and then there would be a sports one, and then a comedy one. There's a real mixture of comics, with, uh, of, of comic stories within. Uh, and it was published by National Allied Publications, which eventually becomes what we know today as DC Comics. Now, a couple interesting things to note about Superman's first appearance that people don't always get, and I think it's, it's interesting given how much we think about him as a part of the American pantheon of, of legendary characters. First, that he's an orphan, both from Krypton and on Earth, right? So his parents have to send him to Earth, and when he gets to Earth, he doesn't end up with Ma and Pa Kent, he ends up in an orphanage. And I think it's a very telling thing in the 1930s that Siegel and Sh Schuster, Siegel in particular, who's, uh, whose father was actually shot, um, and therefore, you know, not leaving him entirely orphaned, but having lost a parent that uh, Superman himself actually doesn't have parents on Earth. Uh, what's interesting about this first issue is Superman as a character acts on several different levels. Uh, he acts on the local level. He basically beats up a wife beater. He acts on the state level where he prevents a, uh, a person from from being committed to death row because that person is in, innocent. And he operates on a national level. He find, he jumps over to Washington, D.C. to listen in on a lobbyist who's trying to create a, trying to manufacture a war. So what's fascinating is, you know, very early on, his attempt to really, you know, be that champion of the oppressed, the physical marvel who had sworn to devote his existence to, existence to helping those in need, is really quite true. I mean, he operates on the local, state, and national, or you could say international level, just within 16 pages. Uh, so he's a fascinating character, and he, he really does get the attention of lots of people. Within a few months of that, it becomes clear um, that Action Comics is selling like no other title. And so, of course, DC Comics or National Allied Publications quickly give Superman his own title, in addition to having him regularly be in Action Comics. And one of the things we have to see is, as we get into talking about the presence of comics, Superman is a great case study, because he ends up very quickly by 1940, right? He only comes out in 1938. 1940, he has the Adventures of Superman radio show. And this show will actually come to influence the comic, because it will be the first appearance of Jimmy Olsen, and the first appearance and use of Kryptonite. Superman also shows up in film serials. Uh, or he shows up in the Fletcher cartoons of, from 1941 to 1943. Uh, and that's enough to actually even spur uh, Batman, who will come along in 19, uh, 1939. Uh, that's enough to spur Batman, who will come out with two live-action serials, one in 1943 and one in 1949. Uh, 
Superman also gets his first book in 1942, The Adventures of Superman by George Lothar. And elsewhere within popular culture or mainstream culture, uh, Superman very quickly becomes a nationally syndicated comic strip. He appears in many daily and weekly comic strips throughout the country. He also appears in the 1940 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and he also they they celebrate a Superman Day on July 3rd, 1940, at the New York I believe it was New York or Chicago's World's Fair. Um, he is omnipresent very quickly. I mean, if we look at all of these dates, he is appearing in all forms of media within four years of his creation. And so I think it speaks a lot to the power of Superman and the power of comics of how quickly comics explode and people are interested. And when I say people, yes, lots of children, but there were also lots of adults reading comics. It was easier for adults to read comics in newspapers because they could always say, I'm reading the newspaper and that looks authentic, but there were definitely adults also buying and reading comic books. So we have this explosion of comics. Comics are really popular, people are reading them, and they're gaining people's attention, but as comics are largely dominated by superheroes, that actually starts to fade by the mid 1940s and 19 uh, by the mid 1940s and people are less interested in reading comics. Um, there's another reason why comics start to fade or at least there's some concern over comics as well. And that starts initially with Sterling North in 19 in May 1940. He writes an article uh, called A National Disgrace and he talks about comics as a hyper hyper dermic needle to the eye and just how horrible they are um, and he's the first well-known person to really start to criticize comics as some kind of cultural threat but his work doesn't really disrupt comics in any significant way my research has actually shown that if anything he's probably his biggest influence is probably getting getting comics to include uh, sidekicks. I think that's probably his biggest influence with the article that he writes. Um, but superhero comics by the mid-1940s, as people are returning from World War II and have seen the real atrocities, they're looking for something grittier. And that eventually becomes crime comics, and crime comics eventually turn into horror comics. Superhero comics felt a little too... Um, optimistic felt a little too strange to understand or to experience after the atrocities of World War II. Crime comics people re it resonated with people and there was a desire for justice there was a desire for you know processing a lot of the the horrible things that people had been exposed to and that eventually crime comics eventually evolves into horror comics. And the horror comics become very, very popular. And so a lot of what we're talking about this week, you know, they become so popular that, again, like Sterling North, other people rise up in concern about what comics are doing. And so enters Frederick Wortham, a name infamous within comic history, among people that have studied comics or know about comics of the 1940s and 50s. And he writes a very... Uh, a very exploitative, very highly dramatized book called Seduction of the Innocent. Now he's a psychiatrist and he has been working with juvenile delinquents for much of his life and he makes the the argument that we hear even today with video games or the internet or social media that you know he worked with all sorts of juvenile delinquents, all of those juvenile delinquents do read comics and enjoy comics therefore comics cause juvenile delinquency. And he makes a very compelling argument. He's very smart in that he has excerpts of it published in ma mainstream magazines that women read, like Home Journal or Home Home Journal and the like, where women are going to be reading that and they're going to be home and they're going to go and empty out their child's collection of comics. So it was a very, very strategic uh, placing of or use of um, the fear factor about teens, about kids. So 
with that comes the Comics Code Authority. Uh, as we'll see in the documentary, uh, in, and as we'll talk about this this week on while talking on comics, um, Wortham's work ultimately gets a hearing with the Senate sub uh, Senate subcommittee meeting on juvenile delinquency, and in that from that we get the comic the comic industry creating the Comics Code Authority and its power was to regulate comics and to keep horrible things from appearing in comics and it gets ridiculous and it gets silly you can't do things like uh, have werewolves or have vampires or you can't ever provide a story in which a icon of society such as a policeman a judge etc is shown in in any negative way without being punished. What it really does, um, unfortunately, is that it infantilizes comics. And first, it causes, because of that Comics Code Authority, so many publishers that were solely focused on horror can't even produce their titles anymore. And if co if they cannot get the comics stamp of approval, the comics code stamp of approval, they cannot end up on pu on newsstands. So many publishers close. But then the other piece of this is that censorship really does destroy the ability for comics to tell complex stories. So it's this self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, comics are for kids. We should censor them and not allow them to tell com complex stories therefore comics will always be for kids and there's never an opportunity for comics to really tell um, powerful meaningful stories that we've seen them be able to do in the last thirty or forty years as that comics code authorities power has has lessened so that's brief introduction to superhero comics and horror comics and in kind of where we set the scene for uh, this week as we take a look at comics. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video.